Thank you very much, Ken. Um, quickly, the other books are, they, they were long titles. One is Achieving Excellence in Academics. It's very specific to school stuff. And, um, and then there's uh, Excellence in Character. So those are the four. So sorry about not listing them out. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming out. Um, I won't give you too much credit because you are in a nice weather situation. Um, <laughs> we were stuck yesterday all day. They could not, they didn't plow us out. So um, yeah, so sorry about that. I'm just going to take this to the beginning of my presentation. And um, as a philosopher, we need to be kept in line with time because philosophers can go on and on. But um, I'll give you an outline of what we'll be discussing today. And then I would love to hear any questions you have, any concerns, uh, any objections, anything, and then we'll go from there. So let me, um, we'll turn our attention to the outline and then I will break it down. I have a clicker. I'm just going to connect that back to my computer and then we'll be all set. So if you give me one second, I'm just gonna put back the clicker here and then it just allows me to um, interact much easier, so. Okay, well, good evening again. My name is Amos Tarfa. I grew up in Nigeria which I'll show you on the map here. But that's my brief outline. I'm gonna tell you about my background. I'm gonna address different branches of science and how they point to truth. But as I was preparing for my presentation, I shared some things with my wife and I realized that there are some things that, um, you know, God gives us all different gifts and tools, right? And, um, and different passions and different areas of focus. And so we are to use all our gifts and our tools, everything for the glory of God. And my passion has remained the same <clears throat> and has remained the same. I wrote a little bit about this in one of my books called um, The Pursuit of Excellence, which is essentially, um, it was called Christianity 201, The Pursuit of Excellence. That book, the problem with it is that it had so many sections in it. So some of those had to then become their own book. And that was what gave rise to about two of my books. <laughs> But then um, the math book, which I wrote, is called Tools for Mastery Mathematics. Uh, I do like mathematics, and um, I see there's a few young people here who are still taking math courses. So maybe you learned a thing or two about mathematics uh, today. So we're going to discuss the intelligibility in the universe. We're going to discuss the beauty in creation, the implications of creation. We're going to talk about it briefly, and then at the end, I'll probably spend more time on it again. Uh, we're going to look at some people behind the mathematics and science. Some of that is just a commercial, just to, as uh, the mathematician John Lennox used to say, just to whet your appetite, I guess, for mathematics. So you grow in your love for math as you see a lot of those people had Christian roots. And then uh, we're going to talk about apologetics in the age of science and philosophy. Okay, let's get started. So uh, this is Africa. If you have not uh, seen the map of Africa before, that's the map I'm assuming everybody has seen. Uh, Africa. That's Nigeria. Um, it's the most populated country in Africa, about 180 million people. Um, that is about, think about the size of Alaska maybe, for example, and then put 180 million people. And so there's a lot of people in Nigeria. It's uh, filled with a lot of natural resources, uh, very, um, yeah, endowed and blessed. So I grew up there and that's, I grew up, I was born in the Northeast. And the reason why I put this map up is because most of you will know about where I was born, which is uh, where the Boko Haram issue has been happening. Some of you have read uh, Voice of the Martyrs. So I was born in that territory. Um, and so I left in 1994 before there was any of that. And then uh, a lot of those things began in, in about 2007. I believe they, they increased in intensity. But I moved to Lagos, um, which is, uh, Lagos is in the, right there in the, at the bottom there. So I grew up in uh, I was born in, in Adamawa State, which is over there, and then we moved to Lagos. And for me, that was a huge change because I went from not necessarily being able to speak English to a place where most people spoke English. And um, I mean, I spoke a little bit here and there, but uh, my dad encouraged us. We spent more time practicing. And then, of course, British English is the uh, language overall in, in Nigeria. But that, in Lagos is where I began to grow. And, um, and by God's grace, I spent most of my life in Lagos. That's me in first grade. Um, my wife sent me that picture. The reason why it's important is because I've always loved learning. I've always loved the idea of learning. And, and, um, and so when I was in first grade, I was blessed to be, I was the second in the class and we got awards. Not everybody got a trophy. Only the first three people got, got awards. And so, um, I, and by God's grace from first grade to fifth grade, I kept bouncing around, you know, first, second or third. And um, so that was the beginning, I guess, of my years of enjoying math and science. 
This is me in high school, about to graduate, and uh, I'm standing next to a gentleman um, who um, was uh, the student, the school captain, which is like the, the, the student body president, after me. So I was a student body president in 2004. He took over from me. So we're just taking pictures. We get a little, you get awards for serving. And so this was the opportunity I got to serve. And believe it or not, because of being the student body president or the school captain, it opened certain doors for me, which then led me to be here today, essentially. So some of why I'm here today is because of that picture right there. Uh, because in 2004, uh, and I'll go back to, to that, but in 2004, I was given the opportunity to serve March 8th, 2004. Maybe that date, the fact that I remember the date tells you that it's probably an important thing, but that was the opportunity that then led me to write, which some of those writings became a book because I used to share it with uh, students. And um, when I went to speak with schools after graduating, they asked, you know, they, they asked, who are you? Where are you from? These are other high schools while I was waiting at home. And they found out, oh, you're a student body president? Okay, we want you to talk to our students. While I was doing that, someone in the U.S. Embassy heard about this kid traveling around town and wondered what I was, you know, what are you going to do for a university? Well, the universities were backlogged, essentially. You had to wait for a year or two sometimes, doing nothing. And so that was what I was doing. And then he asked me if I would be willing to come to the U.S. So that was part of the story. But some of it, of course, is a testimony. God opened the doors that led to that opportunity. So we thank God for that. This is my wife, Stephanie. Um, she's from Minnesota, and um, we live in Superior, Wisconsin now. And then we have four kids. Um, Eliana is on the right, well, on, on, on my right. And then we have the three boys, Joshua, uh, Isaiah, and Nehemiah. And then we're expecting a baby girl later this month, God willing. So that's my family. Um, so now let's talk about some background. Some might wonder, well, how does this all tie together as far as your talk on truth? And, and your background in science and so on. One of my dreams as a child was to be a medical doctor. And why, the reason why I wanted to be a medical doctor was to help young people, especially children, um, you know, guide them, encourage them to live lives of excellence. And then I read a book in 2005, 2006. This was before he ran for president. Ben Carson wrote a book called Gifted Hands. And then he wrote another one called Think Big. And I read that book. Uh, there are a few books that I have read in my life that have uh, affected some of my trajectory or some of my way of thinking. And that was one of them, Think Big. Uh, as a matter of fact, by the grace of God, when I graduated from Superior, I was given the opportunity to give the commencement speech. And I actually referenced back Think Big, which I read before coming to the US. And so he, the Think Big is an acronym. And one of the things I noticed about his style of doctoring was that he was using it as a platform to encourage young people. So I thought, I want to do what he's doing. I didn't think I wanted to be a neuroscience, neuro, neurosurgeon, though, which was, it looked intense. I mean, I could do it. You just won't have a life. And so I didn't want to <laughs> go that route. But, um, and so anyway, so I didn't go all the way, but I wanted to be a pediatrician. That was the goal. Then I arrived in 2007. I started in chemistry. I did get my chemistry degree. But in 2009, I went over to the professor of philosophy on campus. I wasn't taking his class, but I just wanted to share with him some thoughts. And I said, I've heard about what's going on in philosophy. And I just wanted to tell you that I am a Christian and I do believe the Bible to be true. And I just wanted to be aware of that. And, and if we know the law of non-contradiction, we're not both right. Uh, one of us is wrong. And of course, I was polite about it, but I was just trying to tell him that th this idea that, you know, you can teach that there is no God or, or that you can lead people to think that evolution is a fact and this and that. Th that and he knew that there was an opposing alternative, but he hadn't met many people who actually would say that they believed opposite. So I made, made it clear that, I'm, you know, this is where I stand. And again, I'm not in your class, but just want to tell you I've heard about it. And I, you know, I want you to know that uh, there are people who believe the Bible to be true. And so he said, why don't you take my class, philosophy of science, this, uh, this uh, was spring, it was going to be spring, uh, January to May. And I said, sure, I'll take it. I didn't have to. I was supposed to graduate in chemistry, but I said, I'm going to take philosophy of science. And in April of 2009, something happened that changed the course of my life partly. The reason why I wanted to be a doctor was not a bad reason, but was that the reason why God made me to exist in, in, in terms of my purpose specifically. Now, some people will say, I don't know that I have a specific purpose, right? I just think I'm supposed to do this. And God gives us these general purposes that we have. We're supposed to share Jesus Christ and shine the light of Christ wherever we go. Now, how we display some of what God has given us can be a platform. And for me, medicine would have not been the best platform as of that time. And I'm glad today with all the cultural wars, I'm glad I don't have to deal with that as a doctor, but I'd rather deal with that as a, a teacher of a sort. And so, 
What happened in 2009 was he invited a, a, a professor who was an atheist to share with the class on April 1st, 2009, why the, the existence of God was not possible because of the problem of suffering. And so I, uh, I had listened to some apologetics through the months. Keep in mind that before coming to America, I had never met an atheist ever in my life. I had never met a person who didn't believe in God. Everybody I met believed in God. I had heard of someone who had gone to MIT, who had come back, who was an atheist. I never met anyone. Uh, but, but again, it's not nothing against MIT. It's the best school in chemistry and math. But the point is, I would never met anyone except I'd heard of someone. So now I'm sitting in a classroom. You know, you've prayed this morning, you read the Bible, and then somebody tells you that there is no God. Well, there's a problem, sir. We have to clarify Okay, sorry, I have to say this, just to give you some context. The existence of God is not the same thing as the existence of some car or some finite entity. If God exists, He exists, period. If He doesn't exist, He doesn't begin to exist. He's eternal. Because of His nature, that discussion is critical to understand that to negate the existence of someone who is infinite is to have some sort of infinite knowledge that you have capable to let you do that. You can't do that. It's not even a thing you can do because you don't have the ability. You haven't even searched out the galaxy, right? The solar system, what, what are you talking about? Because if God does one thing in 1945 in one part of the universe and never does anything again, he still exists. Because once he ex exists, he doesn't cease to exist. So, so it's, we need to understand that it's not the same thing as, do you believe this thing exists or that thing exists, which has affinitude to it. This is a being that is infinite. And so I, I shared with the professor my thoughts in the classroom and some of the students who just wanted to get their grades for the class and go home. And some cared, but some were just sitting there not caring. But they took us to the faculty lounge out after. And they said, you guys need to go talk about this. And so we talked about, I shared some of my views. So my professor was very welcoming of this. He wanted us to have dialogue. So we had that dialogue. I left that room in, on April 1st, 2009. Uh, I was about to take my medical school exam. And I said, I can't do this. I can't sit in a room and you come and tell me something that is illogical. And I want to treat the mind first, and therefore medicine is probably not my best route. And so I, that was the day that my medical school dream died. But I thank God for that, because I was released then to focus more on teaching, which leads to the other thing I did, which is teach for two years. And I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the process of focusing on the mind and helping people to discover why they exist. So anyways, that gives you some background of some of what, what led to where I am today because of the opportunity of sharing my faith and uh, with this professor. Um, I still keep in touch with my philosophy professor. He retired, but he's still, he and I still keep in touch through email. And I'm hoping that someday he and I will agree on, on what matters most. Um, so this is medical physics briefly. Medical physics deals with the application of physics to the needs of medicine. I focus specifically on x-rays, CT, nuclear medicine, and radiation safety. And so we just make sure, so there's three branches. I focus on the nuclear medicine and the diagnostic. We make sure that all those modalities I listed are being used properly and that the image quality is good for the radiologist, but is also um, the patients I get in the lowest dose necessary. So that's some of what I do uh, with medical physics. That's my full-time position. But I still write and I enjoy teaching uh, about faith and science and so on and so forth. So let's dive in. Uh, now that I've given you some background of, of where I've come from, we're looking at the unchanging nature of truth. But one of the things I want to do with truth is I want to look through the lens of science and I want to look through the lens of mathematics and I want to talk about the implications of these truths. If, if it is true, if, if what we believe is true, what are the implications? That's some of what we'll be talking about today. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the beginning, that's the fundamental. If that's not true, then nothing else that the Christian says should be taken seriously. The same thing with 1 Corinthians 15. If you take those two, right? If Christ did not rise from the dead, then we are of all people most miserable. And I think people don't understand that sometimes, that we are not just saying we think, we're guessing. Or maybe, you know, I'm just laying my life in a guess. No, we're saying there is fundamental truths that govern our lives. The nature of truth is such that it can't change. Truth has to stay if it's true. Now, facts can change, right? 
The richest man in the world, they've been bouncing around. If you followed them, number one and two have been moving around, right? Um, I, I grew up and we always kind of knew who was the richest, whatever. Okay, so the fact might be, this guy's the richest today, but tomorrow there's a new fact. But truth is not something that just bounces around. Now, what's interesting about truth is that it never changes. And of course, we know God is eternal. And then Jesus calls himself, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So we see People call it, they say epistemic truth and ontologic truth. Don't worry about all those words. The main thing is truth never changes. Now, truth in a person, in Jesus Christ, we also see in his attributes that he's always been. So truth is not something that just changes like that. So then you meet people in society, and I have this later on, but I'll say it right now, who say, well, there is no truth. Well, I don't believe in truth. Well, here's the thing about truth, and that's why I love mathematics, is that it doesn't care about your feelings. And the problem is we live in a culture of excessive based you know, feelings, excessive feelings based thinking. Oh, I don't feel good. Oh, I don't feel that this sounds right. Whatever. No, I don't want my bridges built by people who say that bridge should feel good if you go over it. No, I don't care how I feel. I want the numbers to work and I want the bridge to work. So we need, yes, there's a place for feelings. I'm not saying you can't have feelings or emotions. No, but when we're dealing with truth, truth is a serious matter. And the problem with saying there is no truth is that that in and of itself has to be true in order for the claim to be true. So by saying there is no truth, you negated the very claim you made. You can't do that. And as one philosopher said, I feel like I'm in a maze. I can't get out. What do I do? Well, you got to submit to the fact that there is truth. Rather than saying there is no truth, which only takes you round in circles to the point where you realize you haven't said anything. Because what you said destroyed what you said. Okay, so there is truth. And the truth cannot change. Isaiah chapter 40, we'll look at that at the end, where God talks, where we see some of the attributes of God again. Job 38, God, we look at some of the attributes of God again. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. My friends, it's unfortunate that in our time, in this time in our nation and in the Western world, people want to experiment on things that are not true. But instead, they will find out at the end that if you don't follow the way of truth, you only get in trouble. In the beginning, as I said, God created the heavens and the earth. We know there was a plan right from the beginning, and that's good to keep in mind. Let's talk about the word intelligibility. And I'm sorry, these are a little smaller because I wanted to break it down, and I'll read off what it says. Part of what I'm trying to explain is that God has made his attributes known to us, okay, in his world, in his creation. And he has made it so that the universe is intelligible. Okay, well, what are we talking about? Well, Intelligibility is the state or quality of being intelligible. Intelligible is to be able to, uh, something to be able to be understood or comprehensible. Comprehensible is something to be able to be comprehended. So God has made the universe in such a way that it can be understood, not just from seeing certain patterns, but sometimes even down to formulas that govern the patterns. So before, and, and this is one of the problems for a person who might believe in a universe that has no direction or an evolution, how do you explain the intelligibility in the universe which is independent from the evolution that happened, quote unquote? It's as though something was built in, and we're going to read some, scientists, uh, quote, some quotes from some scientists about these issues as we go on. So let's talk about science for a second. And I want to do this because it's going to help you understand when people tell you, oh, I believe in science. Do you, do you, do you, are you a Christian? Do you believe in faith? Oh, no, I believe in science. What are you talking about? <laughs> what is science? As a matter of fact, in my philosophy of cl science class, the first book we read is called, What is This Thing Called Science? Did you even know there was, well, I'm not saying you, but did you, did people don't even know, you know what I mean? You should ask people, do you even know that there's a debate about what science is? Do you know people get PhDs in the demarcation problem of what science is and what science isn't? I mean, did you know that it's not settled? Oh, really? Yeah, it's not settled at all. So when you say you believe in science, what are you talking about? What, what is science when science itself hasn't figured itself out? And so, uh, I, again, I was formally introduced to it in 2009. I, well, the focus of the class was on the theory of evolution. After we learned what is science, then they took the creationist view and the evolutionist view, and they were trying to explain how the philosophy of science explains those. Now, I had a blast in the class, of course. Every day going to class was a chance to share why, of course, the Bible has the answers. And sometimes it's not just giving that, the fact that the Bible has the answers. It's showing people the inconsistencies in their reasoning without necessarily telling them anything from your point of view. So when they see that their reasoning breaks down, well, they have to answer. Well, what do you have to say now? You have to answer for yourself. If you believe that what you believe is true, it should be logically consistent. There should be, you know, empirical 
adequacy to it. You should be able to show some, tr you know, some, some uh, evidence to it. And a lot of people don't have that and they end up having faith and then they accuse the Christian for having faith when they have faith and deny it. So the philosophy of science deals with, again, how does science help us make sense of the universe and, and just understanding the nature of science? Uh, I want to say this now because this is very important to all I'm saying. So if you leave it here today, one of the things I want you to go away with is the universe can be comprehended. That in and of itself points to a big issue. If you don't believe in God, how do you explain its comprehensibility? You have to give an answer. And if you don't have an answer, then again, at least don't throw stones at those who believe in truth. If you don't have an answer, go sit down and think about your answer. So let me say this, which is very critical to my whole talk today. In science, there is explanations that are given for phenomena that are observed. The phenomenon that is observed can be without question, but the explanation given for the phenomenon can be brought into question. Gravity, right? Some people say, oh, gravity, this and that. Some people tell you, oh, no, Newton got it wrong here, here, and here. Okay, no, no, no. Let's not talk about where Newton got it wrong. Let's talk about the phenomenon of if I throw something up, does it come down, right? My clicker was kind of expensive. I'm not going to throw it up, but I'm kidding. It was, it was cheap, but I'm not throwing it. But you get the point. Everybody has seen things go up and down. We can agree on the phenomenon, but we might not agree on the theory that explains the phenomenon. Okay, we get that? Here's my concern with evolution, if I can just say this. We haven't even established a phenomenon. The phenomenon is not even established. So to, to then make a theory on an unestablished phenomenon, that's like double trouble. Because you haven't established a thing that you're now trying to describe with a theory. How does that make sense? And yet we have young people going around without purpose or direction in their lives because they think, yep, I evolved. That's why I'm here. Well, the phenomenon is not even established. And some of it is because it's a historical science. That means that people should, be, should not be disqualified from the event, right? So when you disqualify a creationist, that's not fair because you yourself don't even have the phenomenon established. Now, I grew up in a country where we were fine talking about creation and so on and so forth. And I'm really sorry it's not the case in America. Um, at least to give people a chance to question evolution. That in and of itself is even a problem in America. And we need more young people to speak in love and truth to their professors and ask true, well, good questions that make the professor think twice about what they're saying. Because if your worldview tells you that there was a transition between one organism to the next, then when you find an organism that looks like the two of them, you're going to say that's a transitionary form. But if your worldview says they were distinctively created and you find one that looks like both, you can be right in saying that that might have been an, a specific species itself. Neither of you can take the place of that. But no, they've chosen to block one out. And that's not fair. So we have the battle of worldviews. And we have young people in school who are not bringing up intelligent, n polite questions to the professors to help them think about what they're saying. Professors and teachers need to know the truth as well. And so anyways, that's a plug for you if you have a young person in school to encourage them. And maybe they're doing that already. That's wonderful. We thank the Lord. But they need to keep doing that more and encouraging the person speaking about the issues to think about what they're saying. They can read Darwin's book and tell you why they think there's problems in it. And they, they should bring those issues up. So we discussed what science is and what truth is. Now let's talk about one thing that is the opposite, which is the extreme scientism in our culture. Now, extreme scientism, the idea that science is it. There is nothing else that, that you know, I believe in science. Well, science does not answer the question of why. When I push control A on a computer, what does it do? It highlights all. When I push control C, it copies. And when I push control V, it pastes. Science tells you what I just told you. Control A does this, control C. But why does my computer do that? There had to be a step before that. Somebody had to program it to do that. So you hear about people talking about the multiverse theory and so on. Oh yeah, our universe is just one out of many and if you play around with the numbers. Well the problem is somebody set the code so that when the numbers clicked, it worked. Why did it work in that case? Why did it work? These are questions that people don't realize. Again, science can tell you some of the here's this and this, but it can't tell you the why. 
As John Lennox once said, somebody can bake a cake and bring it to a gathering. The chemist will break it down in this way. The physicist will break it. The ke- everybody will explain the nature of the cake. But then somebody comes and says, sorry, why does the cake exist? Now somebody needs to reveal it's for Aunt Rachel's birthday. Do, do you see, science can't tell you that. So these are things that concern me as I, as I interact with different people when they put their trust in science. Again, scientism, the idea that, oh, you know, again, do, do you believe anything? Oh, I'm, I, I'm a scientist. I don't believe anything. No, 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 no. You haven't answered the question. What is the basis of the science that you're talking about? Okay, so now let's, let's uh, we've looked at the limits of science. We've looked at the fact that truth remains. Now let's look at the nature of the world that God has made. And of course, which some of that shows his character. And I'm going to bring back my clock just so I, I stay on task here. Okay, so this is what it says. Uh, the universe, God created the heavens and the earth. How big is the universe, right? Uh, the, the scale of the universe is almost too large to comprehend. This was done by somebody in California. And they mentioned, or, or they used California as a reference. While there's disagreement on the exact numbers, we say there's about 46, uh, well, sorry, about 100 billion galaxies out there. That's what some scientists say. They say that it's about 9.46 trillion kilometers, okay? And if you drove from Los Angeles to San Diego, about 120 miles, and you did it 100 billion times, and then you did that for 46 billion years, you'd be halfway across the universe. That's the size of the universe, okay? That's my point. Now, the universe, we'll just keep seeing how big it is. It's big, right? That's not debatable as far as... Christians, non-Christians. We can agree the universe is vast, true? It's vast. Um, in in uh, 1992, one of the questions was, again, what does science tell us about God? You see how the culture is trying to bring questions about science and faith, right? This is one of the uh, Nobel Prize winners. This is what he had to say about science and math. He said, why nature is mathematical is, again, a mystery. The fact that there are rules at all is a kind of miracle. Behind this slide, what you see is the snail. Right, The Fibonacci numbers are represented in that. Then this is where it brings us back to what I was saying. Albert Einstein once said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. That you can actually get it, right? It's just mind-blowing. A few more quotes, and then we'll dive back in. Another Nobel Prize winner says, the enormous usefulness of mathematics in natural sciences is something bordering on the mysterious and that there is no rational explanation for it. Except if you believe there was a creator of the universe, right? It makes sense. But that's where scientists are again. They cannot see truth. They cannot see the nature of truth because they have not turned to the one who is the author of all truth and who is the truth. They refuse to turn to him. And I'm going to end, I'm going to finish up with some quotes by a few more scientists and then we'll tie it all up together. Again, what are my main points? The universe is comprehend. You can comprehend the universe. That is a miracle. Somebody had to have created this beforehand. And that one, again, he is the truth and the author of all truth. And if we are going to live lives that make sense, which is where my implications of creation talk will end, then we need to look at how he calls us to live because he created us for a purpose. This is a quote by Galileo and just some random formulas in math. But he said, mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe, right? So mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. The, and somebody else says, it, well, he says it's the language of science. We have constants in mathematics, some of them very specific to certain decimal places. Just makes you wonder, right? So let's look at one more physicist as we wrap up, or one more scientist. He said, a common sense interpretation of the data suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well, with, as well, as, well as with chemistry and biology. Again, no, it's not a, just a super... Uh, intellect or whatever, we're talking about the creator of the heavens and the earth. God has made his evidence so clear, and yet many people will not submit, including many of our scientist friends. Okay, so we've established that, that, that science can show us some things. Science can only do so much. But we know that God created the heavens and the earth, and therefore there's implications to that. So let me talk about the implications just to bring some things closer to home. Is that okay? And then we'll finish up with some of my favorite scientists um, and mathematicians and what they have to say about truth. If we were created and if creation is true and if the truth exists, how now shall we live? Well, we need to live lives of purpose. 
We need to live lives of focus, focusing and striving to become all that God made us to be. We need to live lives of proper prioritizing, God first. Because if I say I believe in creation, but I live a life that doesn't make any sense, then I'm living a contradictory life. And if you know one thing about truth, truth has consistency to it. Do you know why one plus one is two? Because any other answer results in a contradiction which breaks down logic, therefore it has to be. So one plus one is two, we don't argue that. Philosophers have written about that. Again, some people have time on their hands, uh, but, but one plus one is two, right? And so if, the, if, the, if, if, if we're created, then we should live lives of purpose, of focus, of proper prioritizing. The gospel should shine forth in our, how we live because that is what it all comes to. Not just believing that I was created, but that there's more to the narrative in seeing my need for Jesus Christ and in surrendering my life to him and allowing him reign and live in me and work through me. Because, you know, the, the, there was the fall. That, that's what I'm trying to say. So we have the creation, but there was the fall. And God made a way through Jesus Christ that we will be saved. And believing on him does not negate believe, understanding his world in science and math. It doesn't. As a matter of fact, it propels you to action. Recognizing the creator of the heavens and the earth has revealed himself. He's told you why the cake exists, quote unquote. Does that make sense? He's told you why you exist and why I exist. So we should live lives of humility, recognizing that God is the creator. Because when we read some of these passages I listed, you see God reminding us, we are but grass, right? We're here today, gone tomorrow. But he remains and he's eternal. And the second set of this, let me use some deductive reasoning. This is a only logic we'll use for now. But whatever was willfully created has a purpose. We were willfully created. Therefore, we have a purpose for our existence. Logic, truth, Math, science, again, all of these, if we're looking at the science that, well, if we're looking at truth and its implications, it all points back to God creating us. And if he created us, then there's a reason for us existing. So we cannot go around saying, well, I don't know why I exist. I don't have any reason to be around. Oh, no, there's a reason for you to be around. And you need to find where it is that God is giving you opportunities to share his love with others. So one of the implications of creation is that we all have talents. So what I want to do now um, is I want to take a step in history and I want to bring some things to your mind and your memory. Um, Ken had mentioned that I gave a talk in mathematics. Uh, well, he e in our emails, we talked about a talk I gave in mathematics. And I thought, you know, it was interesting. I was afraid to give the talk because I was afraid some people were just going to say, nope, I'm not listening to this when they heard math. And so what I did was I stole a few slides that were relevant to that. And I tried to tie it back to what we're discussing tonight. Because it will give you a new appreciation for God's world through a mathematical lens. We've talked about science and its limits. Now, again, science just tries to give a description of some things. I'm not going to go through the history of science and its definition. It's very long. But what I will tell you again is that we see patterns, and we try to find out why those patterns exist. God set everything in motion and is still in control. And so that's why science can make sense. Why should we expect repeatability? Why should we expect some of these things if there was no design in the first place? We shouldn't expect it. But some people did, and I'm going to talk about them tonight briefly. So let's look at the short list. These are some of my all-time favorite mathematicians. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a Hall of Fame mathematicians list. Probably not, right? I think these guys are so cool. We need to be doing more of this in math competitions than some sports in some cases. Math should actually be a sport in the Olympics. But anyway, so these are some of them. Uh, I'm going to focus on three of them. Blaise Pascal, Leonard Euler, and Isaac Newton. And we're going to look at how it ties back to this. Don't worry, there's no exam. There's no, you're just going to see some of their math, and it'll be done. I, I would hope that you go home and read some of their books, but you don't have to. So Galileo, you guys know, look at the years, about 1564 to 1642. He died the same year Isaac Newton was born. That is interesting, because he laid the platform for Newton and many people who came after him. Rene Descartes, why is he on that list? Because believe it or not, some of these other guys read his book, which affected them, including Einstein. I believe he read Descartes' book as well. Descartes died pretty young. He used to go tutor at like 4 a.m. in the morning. I don't know why they set him up to do that. He died of pneumonia. Uh, he used to be a teacher to the Queen of Sweden. Uh, Blaise Pascal, one of my favorites, died at 39. But what's the unit of pressure? Pascal, right? Uh, so when we name that after him, it shows that there's something about 
his hard work. He also invented a calculating machine. Leonard Euler, 1707. Um, notice the years that most of these people lived, right? They came out of the Dark Ages, and a lot of them came to the scene. And people like Isaac Newton realized something, right? And these are the remaining two I was going to mention. Of course, Einstein never professed as a Christian, but I put him there as a, one of those who was influential in science and its beginnings, uh, well, in modern science. But Kepler also is on that list of Christian scientists. So when we go back, most of these people were Christians, by the way. So most kids do not understand. And so they tell us that, oh, no, you, you know, if you're a scientist, you have to let away the, the issue of, uh, uh, you know, faith and so on. That's not true. Isaac Newton, Leonard Euler, Blaise Pascal, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is what I want to do with Newton. I'm just switching back to explain what he said. This is one of the things Newton said, okay, the year that Galileo died. And then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the quote that has to do with truth. He said, I do not know what I, I may appear to the world, but to myself I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Now, Newton was a little too humble in saying that. He's like, no, Newton, stop that. We still haven't done too much in, in, in some fields. We're still you know, leaning on what you did. But Newton is saying that I have discovered some things, but there's an ocean of truth that lay before me, okay? And he's the one who said, well, he quoted someone and said, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Now let's look at what Newton says about God's world. This is what Newton said. We know about gravity. We know how it works, and we understand the solar system somewhat. And then he said, though these bodies may indeed continue in their orbits by the mere laws of gravity, Yet they could by no means have at first derived the regular position of the orbits themselves from those laws. Thus, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. He goes on to quote some Bible verses after this. What is the Principia? It is undisputedly one of the most profound works of science and mathematics in history. And in the Principia, that's one of the things Newton mentions. So when we talk about truth and we talk about science and so on, there is no disagreement with believing in truth and having our faith in Christ and doing science and mathematics. There is no disagreement there. And then we look at one of the top mathematicians of all time. Tell us again that though these bodies may continue by the laws of gravity and so on, they did not derive their very position by those very laws that govern them now. They need an explanation. And that explanation must be something that is be outside that created the universe with the way it operates. The truth does not change. It remains. And science just happens to intersect some patterns once in a while. And then we put it in mathematics. But the truth never changes. So we're seeing that the scientists themselves and the mathematicians are pointing us back to this truth, which leads me to another mathematician that I will wrap up with in terms of these math people, Leonard Euler. Leonard Euler was born in 1707. Isaac Newton at this point was at the end of his mathematical career. He died in, in 1783. He went blind in one eye and then blind in the other eye, had 13 kids and lost about five of them or so to illnesses. But he worked hard. He's one of the most published mathematicians of all time. He was classmates with Daniel Bernoulli, who is the man who we say the Bernoulli's principal. And I'll show you a slide of the Bernoulli people in a second. But Euler, in his book, Elements of Algebra, which I have, uh, is available online free of charge. But I looked at his book, and in the beginning, they were talking about Euler. Here's one of the things they said about him. He was such a defender of truth that those who did not side with truth concerned him, and he wanted to win them over to truth. And his Christian faith could not be hidden. Leonard Euler? I mean, if you know who Euler is, right? Let me use him in, re in reference to a sport. Maybe you've heard of Michael Jordan. That's the Michael Jordan of mathematics. And we're saying that he was so in love with truth. I'll show you one more thing about Euler, but let me end with, this is the last mathematician I told you, Blaise Pascal. This is him. He wrote a lot, died at 39. Uh, this is just a commercial, just something funny. This lines that you're seeing on my screen, each line is kind of small, but the first one says Jacob Bernoulli, Johan Bernoulli, uh, Nicholas Bernoulli, Nicholas Bernoulli the second, Joanne Bernoulli, Joanne, and so on. These were all mathematicians from the, all of the Bernoulli family, all of them, okay? The one in the middle here, I isolated him because he was Euler's classmate. His father was one of Euler's teachers, 
And his father ended up competing with the son, Daniel Benuli, the one who came up with Benuli's principle. Well, you, we talk about Benuli's principle, how planes fly. And he did better than his father in math. So his father was mad and they never got along. But anyways, <laughs> um, that was that, which is unbelievable. But yeah, so look at what one family can do, right, of mathematicians. Wow. Okay, so now let me bring it back to Euler. I just wanted to tell you about that guy. Who has seen this before? This is one of the most beautiful things you will ever see in your life. I, and I, I know, yeah, people might say I'm a nerd. That's fine. Um, <laughs> e over here. Everybody see E? Yeah. It's a transcendental number. It doesn't end. I is an imaginary number, the square root of negative 1. Pi is a transcendental number. It never ends. You add 1 to that, and you get 0. And this is the other way we express it like that. E to the i pi is equal to negative 1. I'm not, putting, I'm not making this up. I heard a physicist or a scientist once say, yeah, this makes me question if I should believe in God. <laughs> like, no, he's saying, his point is, this makes you want to believe that there's something about this universe. How can E to the i pi equal negative 1? Now, there's proofs for this, okay? There's two different proofs. We're not going to do that tonight. You guys will probably uh, beg that I leave. We're not going to do that tonight. But just to give you an idea again, this is E. It goes on forever. Compound interest, right? Uh, that's what E is used for. Pi is 3.14. Some people memorize it on and on. People ask me how many digits. I'm like, why do I need to know more digits? I, got, I have a life. I don't want to know more than three digits. Why do I not want to do more? Because, sure, there's a guy now, I think he's gone up to, is it 1,000 or maybe 10,000? But the problem is, how does that help me in any way? Um, and, and on top of that, by the way, the Bible, when Solomon was building the temple and so on, actually references an estimate of pi. One of the references of pi is in the Bible. And so we look at the Bible and we see some math coming out of it. Now, the nature of math, again, is that it's so tied so close to truth. That's what it aspires to do. And so anyways, I wanted to show you the equation and have you appreciate that even as mathematicians work. Now, who came up with this? Euler. Remember who I told you? Leonard Euler, my friend, my favorite guy now. Okay, um, so th this is that. And this is what someone said. If you looked in a dictionary, that's what beauty, that's what shows up. It was just a, 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 a clip I saw. I thought it was funny. They said, beauty, that's beauty um, in the dictionary. Okay, so what do we make of this? And why do I bring up Euler and Newton and all of these people? The definition of truth is what corresponds to reality. The epistemic definition that is used is logical consistency, epistemic, well, well, let's take it back. Logical consistency is consistent, beginning to end. Empirical adequacy, there's some sort of way to test for how valid it is. Existential relevance is the way Ravi Zacharias would put that. So we say three things about truth. It has consistency to it. If I say something now and I negate what I said a few minutes from now, well, what is the truth? I have to stay consistent. Part of the Christian life and living in truth is living a life that is consistent. What I say matches how I live. It's consistent. So truth deals with, again, correspondence to reality, which is one of the definitions that all philosophers have used. But then what is reality? Reality, are you ready for it? It's not a long definition. Reality is what is. Period. Who stole the cookies yesterday, right? Uh, well, John did a Peter day. Okay, let's now move out of the situation and let's put a camera and let's, well, we put the camera before it happened. And now let's look at the camera. The camera shows that John stole the cookies, okay? But now we're in a court of law and we're arguing whether Peter or Simon did it. But what is the truth? The truth corresponds to reality. John did it. But we could argue all day and actually come to a place where we feel, I think Peter did it. I rest my case. Peter did it. All the evidence points to Peter. His shoes were there. But do you notice that you're not going with the truth? You might have a case for what makes sense. But see why truth is so expensive? Do we see why it's expensive? Because it's the thing that actually happened. It's what is. John did it. Now, how would we know John did it? We need some sort of further investigation. Now, if somebody showed the camera and showed you, and you said, oh, now I can see there's more to it. Now, here's a quick caveat. Things are not true only because you see them. We can't prove the existence of things only by sight, right? You can't see your mind, but I think you have one, and I have one, right? right? But we can't prove it by just sight. Sight is not what makes things valid. Sight can help, 
But sight is not the only thing. Why do I say this? Because some people make the argument, well, I can't see God. Well, you can't see many things you believe. You can't see love necessarily as a thing you see, but you can see it expressed. And so truth is what corresponds to reality. Reality is what is. Okay, so if truth is what corresponds to reality, reality is what is. We see why truth in and of itself should not be changing all over the place. It has to stay the course. And we see the mathematicians, we see the scientists who have come in contact with something that corresponds to reality. But again, that is something that was put in place by something outside of that reality. God created the heavens and the earth. And therefore, we have, not, I mean, there's many scientists, Robert Boyle, we can go on and on, who went after science because they saw the universe made sense only in light of the fact that it was designed and created. Therefore, it should be investigated. If it wasn't created, if it wasn't made that way, you have to tell me why you think some things ought to be. The word ought is an expensive word. If you use the word ought, you imply a plan. Who had the plan? When a doctor looks at your details and they say, this ought not to be, why doctor? There must be a plan, which is why you're going after what you're doing. Without creation, there is no valid medicine for what we should bring you back to in normalcy. There is no true justice for what we should bring you back to that lines up to God's word. Do you see, my, do you see what we're going through? So when you deviate from the truth, you lose your bearing and you get into serious trouble. And my friends, I'm sorry, that's where we've moved to in certain areas of society. We have to stick to the truth of how God intended things to be. For marriage, for life, for whatever God created. Now C.S. Lewis said, you can put water in the gas tank of a car. It might run for a few minutes, but it will break down because it wasn't built to run on water. It was built to run on gasoline. It's funny because Blaise Pascal said long ago that we were created to run on him, on God. Remember now Pascal wrote that in Pensis when he said that we all have a God-shaped hole is the word he used. And only God can fulfill that need. Oh, how much our young people need to know that God is enough. Amen. That there is nothing else they need, but Jesus is enough. Not the acceptance of their friends. Not what society says is true today, quote unquote, that changes tomorrow. How do I trust you when you've been changing around? Right? Some of you have seen the movie Hidden Figures. I don't know if you've seen it, but they had mathematicians. And I'm wondering, wow, it was a tough time to live, you know, with, with all the different laws and segregation, all that. And I'm thinking, wow, this was rough. And now you're telling me, oh, love everybody. Wait a second. Why didn't you do something then? So I'm not going to follow your laws. I'm following what God says. We're created in the image of God. If I stuck to his truth from back in the day, I would be okay. So society and culture keep bouncing around. I'm not going to listen to your tunes. I'm going to listen to his tune because his tune leads to life. And society does not have what leads to life. Jesus has that. And if we can remind our young people that they might be in the minority, they might be looked at as strange for believing God's word. But seriously, are you going to live on water instead of gasoline if you were built to run on gasoline? Sure, they can laugh at you now, but their car will break down. It's just a part of the way we were designed. So, in conclusion, wh where do we go from here, right? How, how do we put it all together? Truth exists. We know that. We see it evidenced in mathematics and science, the Fibonacci sequence and the functions and all these things all around us. We're amazed. The other day I was looking at some birds flying. I told my wife, yeah, I don't think me and that thing have anything in common. We didn't come from the same place. That thing's flying like it knows what it was made to do. Then my son comes and says, oh, dad, do you know the fastest animal, whatever? I'm like, well, the cheetah is the fastest. He's like, no, daddy, something goes 200. I'm like, no, 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 go sit down. Nothing goes 200 miles an hour. And he's like, no, come, I'll show you. And then he shows me this bird. And I'm thinking, what? How could something that goes 200 miles per hour, something that looks like, yeah, you were made to fly. How could we have come from that thing? I mean, we're barely walking 10 miles an hour, right? <laughs> well, five miles an hour. And, and we came from that? I remember someone in my philosophy class being mad and saying, well, if you believe in creation, why didn't God give us wings? I'm like, cool down. You're just angry. Well, I mean, I didn't say I created the world. God created it. You're okay. He was angry that we didn't have wings. Anyways, um, so, so this is where I'm, I'm going to end. And then um, I'll let Mr. Ken come up to the front and, and, and take it from there. One of the things I want to do, I'm starting a method of education. We started it and a, a school program we're working on. But I'm going to start 
doing more of these, hopefully in the Midwest and then overseas. And the goal is to raise up the next generation of people like Euler. Why? We need thinkers. We need people who believe in truth, but who will seek to pursue truth all the way in the academics, but in how they live their lives. Why do I pick Euler specifically? For two reasons. Number one, he was the best, one of the best. I say one of the best because there's a tie. Euler, Gauss, and Newton are usually tied for the top mathematician. The most prolific would be Euler, I would say, in writing. He was blind for a year and published 50 math papers as a blind mathematician. <laughs> they had to dictate things to him. He heard it, and then he worked on, on, on speaking it out. And he published 50 papers. He didn't have any Netflix. That helped. But, but the point is, um, and I don't watch Netflix. I'm just saying he didn't have that. That's part of our problem, right? Many people are distracted. But, but one of the things we see is Euler did his best. And Blaise Pascal, by the way, when he got sick and so on, one of the comments he made is, I, he started doing math and then he got better and he made a comment. I think I was made to do math. That's what he said. And sure, God makes some people to have an extra dose. This is not an excuse for students to say, I'm not doing well in this class because I don't have the math brain. That's false. Uh, the math brain idea actually is not valid. But anyways, some people have an ex extra passion which pushes them to work harder, which makes them better in mathematics. But it's not necessarily that, oh, you're born, just sit down there, trust that you have the math brain. Nope, it doesn't work that way. So we want to see how we can help young people to think of science in light of truth and so on and so forth, but also to strive to be the best they can be as they represent Christ in the academic world, I guess, uh, starting them young. And one of my goals, one of my dreams is that I want to see, you know, kids taking calculus in seventh and eighth grade. I mean, that kind of level. I'm talking, this is no summer breaks on math, okay? So this is not for everybody. This is people that are like, I want to apply myself to be the best that I can be. And being the best that I can be means that I don't take three months off from something that requires daily practice. Anyways, moving on. Uh, I say that because I look at America, I'm like, what are you doing three months off? What? From yeah. math? Uh, I mean, you could do, how many basketball players take three months off from shooting free throws? None, if you want to be a basketball player, right? So anyways, we are destroying our own selves by some bad practices in America. Um, and that's one of them. We're allowing laziness to rule. So here's some verses as we wrap it up. God tells us in, in, in Isaiah 40, he says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? He's measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. He weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him? Who taught him knowledge uh, Sorry, and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and as counted as small as dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor, the, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All the nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. And um, have you not known, have you not heard, has it not been told you from the beginning, have you not understood from the foundations of the earth it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. My friends, we serve a mighty God and his truth never changes. He's revealed himself through science. He's revealed himself through mathematics. He's revealed himself in the very nature of reasoning and logic so that when we do not live in line with logic and truth, we live lives that don't make sense. That's the God that we serve. And he has made you and me for a specific purpose and for such a time as this. The question then is how can we serve him and use all that he's given us and represent him like Daniel and his friends in a generation that has lost its bearing. We're the ones who are carrying that truth, the truth that never changes. We have recognized the universe he's made and the beauty of it. And we bring back the glory to him. The universe can be comprehended. Let us serve the Lord all the days of our lives with all that he has given us. Let us seek to keep digging deep and never settling for less. I'll stop at this point and thank you for your time.